Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of Connecting Online, our 11th annual event. Um, I'm sorry about the previous session. I had some problems. This has never happened to me. Well, it did happen to me in 2010, but uh, I guess it's been uh, 10 years, so uh, it happened again. I lost my connection, but uh, we're back. All right, we're going to have to reschedule the first one. So our next speaker of the day is coming to us from India, and that's Poonam Vara. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I had the yes. pleasure of meeting Poonam, and it was really exciting. Um, you know, it's, it seems that when you meet someone after knowing them for a long time online, and then you meet them face to face, you kind of miss them. It's like meeting family. And, and you want to meet again. So I'm looking forward to seeing you once again somewhere around the world. Same here, same here. Let's hope, let's see where we meet, whether it is in India or somewhere outside India. Yeah. But we will definitely meet. Yeah, so last time it was in New Delhi, it was in, in India, but um, I'm sure next time it's going to be somewhere else. So Poonam is a passionate learner. She has a postgraduate degree in economics and in education. She earned a number of certificates relating to technology. She's very passionate about technology and sharing her work. Uh, she is a very passionate teacher as well as a learner. She's had a rich teaching experience of over 30, 25 years. I guess I think it's probably 30 by now. And um, she's interested in uh, showing others how she uses technology. She is a teacherpreneur, and she believes in adopting pragmatic and flexible approach in handling changes. Um, she's experimented and explored different ways of reaching her students, which includes uh, mindfulness and other techniques. So we're looking forward to your session today, and I'm gonna let you screen share. So uh, your co-moderators, I think you can do that without any problems. I'll just stop sharing and let you do it. So thank you, Poonam, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you and, so much, Dr. Darren. Thank you so I'd much. And I'd like everyone else to please stop your videos. Okay, it's better for the recordings if we only have one up there. And right now it's the presenters. So is it okay? Can you share your screen? Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, great. So I think it is uh, the presentation mode. Wait, let me do it. Okay. I hope everyone can see this. Yes, right. we can. Okay, great. So I just begin my greetings to everyone. In today's presentation, I have a few questions before us. Is it really complex or is it very simple to improve the learner's retention? Is it the right time or we need to prepare ourselves more? Do we really go for such complexities or is it possible to simplify the process? Improving learners retention catches everyone's attention, whether it is educators, whether it is researchers, whether it is analysts, whether it is institutions or learners themselves. <clears throat> Sorry. Being a learner myself, I have tried to understand its basics and share the same. So I begin with the fact that there is enormous potential to improve the learning experiences through analytics. So we need to understand not only what, who, why, and how of learning analytics, but also challenges involved. The challenge of school completion is not confined to any particular country. Millions of children and youth around the world are denied or have limited access to education. For those who attend school, the promise for a future based on their education is dim, causing countless numbers to drop out of the school and look to survive on the streets. Let's have a look at few statistics. 
in US, over 1.2 million students drop out every year. That is, there is a student every 26 seconds or 7,000 students a day who drop out as per the survey done by do something.org. In Canada, the school dropout rates vary, but it is as high as 50% or more in low income communities. According to the pathways to education, and also statistics are given by Canadian Census 2016. If it is Australia, there is one in five young Australians who leave school and are likely to earn less. If we look at India, out of initial enrollments of 100, 70 on an average finish school in India. And there is no disparity so far as gender is concerned. Boys and girls quit school in equal measure. It is the statistics as given by a daily, the Hindu. Dropping out results in the vicious circle of low self-esteem, negativities, and self-blame. It affects their psychological well-being. So let's aspire for the strategies and techniques that prove to reduce dissatisfaction among the learners. To fulfill our aspirations, one has to look into the reasons for dropout within as well as outside the school. In secondary schools, the learners are between 12 to 18 years of age. So one has to take note of various aspects of their learning, whether or not the attitude of learners towards their school experiences, towards their teachers, towards their academic subjects is positive, whether or not the school resources like learning material, technology, library, labs, sports facilities have, an, have been adequately provided and utilized, whether or not the teachers possess the traits of professionalism and conscientiousness, do they have approachable nature, they listen, and provide solutions to the problems faced by the students. Whether or not the classroom environment is disciplined, morality and ethical traits implemented, lesson plans, instructional strategies, teaching learning processes efficiently planned and executed. Whether or not proper rules, policies, and all the managerial functions of academic activities are followed by the leadership to attain the desirable academic outcomes. Whether or not the parents at home and family members encourage the learning atmosphere, whether or not the students are socializing and following their interests, whether or not they are able to maintain their mental well-being. All these factors need to be considered while finding out the reasons for the low academic performance. Because this is multiplicity of factors which may affect their performance. So, there is an, in case any of these factors are not in positive, any or few of them or a combination of these factors are not in positive, there would be low learner's retention. So there is a need to improve learner's retention. 
because it makes them satisfied academically as well as socially. Also, every stakeholder from parents to policymakers looks at it to measure a school's performance. It is not important only for the schools, but also for the universities, as potential students would want to attend a college that has a high number of students graduating. So learners' retention is basically a base for student retention. It's a challenging issue. Responding to this challenge, today, institutions encourage the use of technology-enabled learning, which provides increased flexibility and personalized learning opportunity. So the technology-enabled learning and nowadays its broader digitization of interactions that lead to the opportunities to collect and analyze data. When one starts examining the data to draw conclusions and use it for decision making to present the future course of action that is called data analytics. It can be descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, or prescriptive in nature. Descriptive analytics provide an insight into the past and creates a summary of historical data to answer the question, what has happened? Diagnostic analytics examines data to have a deeper look at it and attempts to understand the causes of events and behaviors to answer the question, why did it happen? Predictive analytics is used to identify future probabilities and trends and tries to provide information about what might happen in future. Prescriptive analytics is applied to try to identify the best outcomes to the events given the parameters and suggest options to best take advantage of a future opportunity or mitigate a risk. So, when data about learners their learning experiences and learning programs is measured, collected, analyzed, and reported for the purposes of understanding and optimizing learning. It is called learning analytics, or we try to measure learning. So it is learning analytics is a convergence of learning and analytics through statistics, through visualization, through data sciences, and through artificial intelligence. Why are we doing this? For design thinking. Design thinking. Design thinking empowers an individual to design the services, to design the systems, to design the experiences that addresses the core needs of those who experience a problem. So when we talk of learning analytics, it has three elements. That is called DAD. D, D data, A, analysis, and DA, the and action. Data is nothing but a set of information collected about the student, the learning environment, the learning interactions, and the learning outcomes. This information is generally gathered from student information system, which provides demographics and academic data, or from learning management systems, 
which provide students activity records as well as their performance information. Data can also be collected from other systems which provide multiple types of information on digital interactions, like the kind of ebooks they read or the social networking information or uh, the library visits and so on and so forth trying to say that data is a very very sensitive asset so the approach should be collect as much useful data as possible and as less sensitive data as required once the data is collected as per the requirement it has to be analyzed analysis is the process of obtaining some inactionable insights from the collected data so it is based on a set of mathematical and statistical algorithms or we say it is based on machine learning techniques or we say it is based on computational thinking or or artificial intelligence but through this data analysis one can obtain two types of learning analytics descriptive which is reactive and predictive which is proactive crossing the bridge that separates descriptive from predictive requires the right kind of a data and the appropriate algorithm so selecting the right data and selecting the right algorithm is an art behind properly implementing the learning analytical process once data is collected and analyzed then the ultimate goal is action but this action has to be supported by the leadership of the institution and they need to create internal data driven culture so action basically is action basically is all about leadership and culture what i'm trying to emphasize is that there should be right internal processes which should be in place so that interventions can take place. One should not forget the reality. And the reality is that the world is more and more data driven. Education is no exception. Learning analytics is an important tool to improve education and to make educational institutions more competitive. And for that, they must implement predictive analytics. So the whole exercise is useful only if there is action. So we would, I would just like to emphasize a little bit on data collection, data analysis, and data visualization, because this is the main aspect of learning analytics. You know, this is a kind of flowchart which explains various learning activities and the sources of data collection. Sources are inherent here. Once the data is collected, it is then stored and processed, analyzed, visualization done, and policy is being enforced. And in the process, learning and teaching activity gets affected positively, and personalized personalization can be done. So one has to, so far as data collection is concerned, one has to be very clear about the purpose since there is 
huge volume of data that is available and is collected, one needs to be very clear about the purpose for which data has to be collected. Depending on that goal, data can then be gathered from engagement related statistics. That is, data can be collected from the site, logins, course access, its location, its IP, its course activity statistics, time spent on the learning, uh, on learning itself, uh, all the session metrics, the frequency, the enrollment, learners origin of access, whether uh, it is home or office or whatever, or device access, whether it is mobile or whether it is desktop. So one set of data is relating to the engagement aspect. Another set of data that can be collected is from the learning activity or we, or it is called as performance statistics. That is to assess the effectiveness of the course. That is it comprises of data relating to participation in various learning activities, including discussions, including the gradebook scores, including the quizzes, the classrooms, the webinars they have attended, the use of resources, their self-assessment, their course progress, student feedback, and so on. Since there is huge volume of data available, I would again say that purpose has to be very clear for what purpose data is being collected. Once data is collected, it has to be analyzed. So this is a kind of flow chart. I will not go into the details, but just a flow chart I'm trying to show, which explains the process of cleaning, transforming, or modeling data. Here the purpose of to gather information is by using proper tool or proper application which allows to explore the data and to find a pattern to enable decision making. And doing analysis is possible only with the help of either softwares or artificial intelligence or having computational analysis. But once data is analyzed, it can either be statistical analysis, which is uh, in the form of, uh, or it can be text analysis, it can be diagnostic analysis, it can be predictive analysis. All this is possible only by using big data softwares, big data analytics softwares and tools, because these tools or these softwares make the process easier to manipulate the data, to analyze the relationships and find correlations between various data sets. These softwares also helps to identify patterns and making trends for interpretation purposes. So it basically um, making it easy for the education providers to have policy formulation or to have interventionist proper adequate interventionist approach to improve a student retention then once data is being collected and analyzed it has to be visualized because visualization it's nothing it's but the graphical presentation of the information which makes it attractive and also makes it easier to understand the trends and patterns in data. So when visualization is done, uh, you know, the student's uh, performance is uh, shown through the dashboards and it would be easier for any individual to understand if the progress or uh, any other variable is shown through charts, through tables, through graphs, through infographics, through area charts, so bubble cloud, cartograms, histograms, matrix, network, or one can have 2D, 3D diagrams, 
or one can have mix and match combination on the dashboard. It has to be very attractive so that it makes it becomes easier for the learner to understand his own progress, his own learning path, so that he can predict about his future learning path. So these are some of the, uh, I'm just mentioning, these are some of the software tools to implement learning analytics in any institution. SNAPP is social networks adapting pedagogical practice. C for S is connect for success. AWE is automated wellness engine. PASS is personalized adaptive study success. These are various tools that are generally implemented by the educational institutions so far uh, to, um, to identify the students who are at high risk, who may be struggling, or who are experiencing disengagement. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, there is a built-in programs. There are various indicators which generates visual signals, their performance levels, their self-assessment, and also provides a personalized environment. There's slight difference that although there is a similarity among these tools, but this SNAPP is basically social networking. It's, it's a real-time social networking uh, analysis and visualization done only for the discussion forum activity. Whereas REST3 are all are a kind of early alert engines. They are proactive, they are fully automated, and they improve, they help in improving learners' retention and further graduation rates. So once the weak students are identified, they can be referred for appropriate services within the university or colleges. If you need to start with the implementing of uh, learning analytics in the institution, this is a kind of reference model that one can go in for. People have been researching, learning and teaching, tracking student progress, analyzing their data, designing assessments, and improving teaching learning processes for a long period of time. The difference here is that in learning analytics, though it is built on uh, these disciplines only, but it seeks to exploit new opportunities because there exist new forms of digital data and huge volume of digital data, which can be used through, uh, once again, artificial intelligence and one can work on this reference model that is what kind of data and environment needs to be studied why should it be studied should it be for uh, the data should be should data be collected for monitoring purposes for analysis purposes for predicting their behavior for in having an interventionist approach or for uh, giving them feedback or or for personal personalization of the whole process. Who's going to benefit? One must answer this as the learners, teachers, institutions, researchers, or designers, everyone. So, and how it will be done? Through statistics, visualization, social network analysis, data mining, so on and so forth. So when any institution is going to start with the learning analytics, this is the framework that they need to follow because it comprises of most of the aspects of learning analytics. Why should we do this? Learning analytics is beneficial for all the stakeholders, 
be it students, be it educators, be it organizations, be it researchers. Technology enabled learning and digitization of interactions have created a lot of opportunities and enabled the educators, education providers to create a unique profile of each student based on his or her demographic details, assessment results, and data gleaned from their interaction with various educational services. So once you have that unique profile, it is easy to, to um, make a plan in order to improve his learning. Then learning analytics, uh, so, so this profile also provides a greater insight into the factors that can affect the student's performance. Not only that, learning analytics help in identifying the learners who are struggling and it is possible to predict their likelihood of academic success or whether they will be able to complete their course or not. So if timely identification is done, improvements are possible. Once it is done, then learning analytics also help in creating tailored intervention plan. That is, one can devise and craft learning experiences and mode of teaching in accordance to the individual ability, in accordance to his or her learning preferences, so that difference can be made, so that the learner can perform at his own pace and succeed academically. Because the whole purpose is to improve academic success and when tailored plan is being made it automatically improves the content quality because learning analytics enables the educators to discover the content consumption pattern to understand their own content quality and hence provide the personalized learning experiences, or we can say adaptive learning is possible. So automatically content quality gets improved. Once content quality gets improved, it helps in increasing retention and performance. So learning analytics may be used, can be used, should be used to reduce dropout rates and increase students' performance. Because having the right insight allows for performing proactive tutoring and intervention. So it allows for personal feedback, personalized feedback, I should say, because that helps. Personalized feedback helps the students with self-reflection and their study planning. So reflective learning automatically gets encouraged. It also allows the institutions to record and track these interventions and share details with the main stakeholders for long-term effectiveness of these initiatives. In this whole process, the learners take responsibility of their own learning, which helps them in improving their retention and progress. Hence, it promotes satisfaction and well being among them. So, it provides better informed learning future to the learners. Now, the question is how it should be implemented because it's a very very new area and whosoever is implementing it for the first time 
will have to face a lot of challenges. So one needs to be slightly prepared when you are implementing it for the first time. One has to, one should follow certain strategies. I'm not going into the uh, details of every, but just trying to touch upon some of the points that uh, one needs to follow the strat some of the strategies to effectively accomplish your learning analytics implementation. When you are, first thing is, when you are collecting data, one should not rely only on learning management systems as it provides ready data. There may be data outside the digital environment which is relevant and must be included. So this data information has to be inferred information collected from various sources, not restricted only to one. This point must be taken care of. Secondly, it's the uh, when you one one has to provide the you know the feedback about the progress. That is one one has to prepare the student dashboard because it is only through dashboard that students receive uh, feedback. It should be display. It should display the overall status of the student, whatever he has been doing, wherever he has been involved, and should be presented this entire information in such a manner that he is able to understand easily and can take immediate action. Then, one must take into account that when we are talking of data, data analytics, learning analytics, it is analytics, analytics only. It's not only about data. This analytics is also about, it's not only about data, it's not only about systems, it's not only about um, you know, dashboards. It is more about finding the factors that contribute to students' failures and or successes and designing the intervention strategies that work in your learning context. So one must list and include every other such factor so that all relevant stakeholders of the project gets included automatically and one can then have, along with the data analysis, one can then have periodic meetings to have follow-ups. Another thing which is very important is, and a point of issue, is the ethical concerns. When you are beginning with an implementation, one should be entirely transparent to all the stakeholders in order to improve students' success. It is said that more data sources you use, better your learning analytics model will be. However, it's not about the quantity, but the quality of your data. And at the same time, there are various mathematical models available to analyze the same data. But more sophisticated a mathematical, mathematical model is, more data is required to do analysis. At the same time, one should not rely only on one model because one model may be appropriate for your or accurate in your context or may not be. So one should not entirely rely on single model, try to explore multiple mathematical models to process the data, 
to have a meaningful analytics. I know it is not an easy job. It's a very, very complex job, but to have accuracy to a reasonable level, it is always better to have two or three such models. Then next is it is very important to monitor the validity of analytical models, trying to say that education is not static. It's a living entity. And one has to keep minimizing the errors by continuously, permanently monitoring the validity of your model, simply because environment changes, simply because students evolve, simply because teachers keep improving their content. So since every variable changes, so model also needs to be updated. At the same time, keeping in view the complexity involved, the whole exercise is to have analysis in such a manner which is simple to understand. That's the whole uh, challenge involved. One needs to present this analytical information in such a format which can be easily understood by each stakeholder and one should so for that since it is very new it's better to start with a small project or we call it as a seed project trying to say that such a project which is limited in scope and cost and can effectively communicate successes while doing this whole exercise, one should not only focus on the failure triggers, rather should search for success triggers. When we are doing this whole exercise, there are challenges too. Like challenges one faces in each area of your life, whether it is technology, whether it is your uh, teaching practice, whether it is your own life. So challenges are here also. Challenges are relating to data, whether the data has been appropriately taken into account. So data capturing is right or not. Uh, its tracing is right or not. Data variety, whether it is uh, only from LMS, whether it is only from one source or variety of sources where it is possible to compare analytics because we are using uh, multiple models for analysis, whether are we able to predict its accuracy, uh, whether the predictions are accurate or not, are we having a partial view, because partial view is possible because we are dealing with human beings. There may be so many aspects which, are, which cannot be quantified data is quantification. So once qualitative data is taken into account, then it may give just a partial view. And more important is data literacy. How many people know how to analyze data, how to interpret analytics and apply the same. So data literacy is major challenge. And out of all these, the biggest challenge is ethics. It's a must. It's very sensitive because if you are not following ethics, obviously your outcome is going to be very shady. Since it is new, though it is being implemented by various universities, I have listed few, I repeat universities, right? And each university have their own program of implementing learning analytics. I must point it out here that it is implemented by universities only. So far as school level is concerned, barring very, very few, it needs to be implemented. It has not been implemented at the school level. School leaving age is 18 years. And the learners are in their adulthood they start thinking about their future course of action. They require a lot of guidance and there is no such analytics available uh, or implemented, I should say, <coughs> not available, <coughs> implemented in the schools. 
So it is an area which is untapped and must be, must be taken care of and research must be done. It must be implemented at school level. That's what I wanted to emphasize. <clears throat> Researchers can take care of this. Let's take the case of India. India's education sector offers great opportunity with approximately 29% of population in the age group of 0 to 14 years. Not only that, India's higher education segment is the largest in the world. It's crucial for educational institutions to track and record demographics, performances, attendance, and so many other such data. Some of the experts feel that there are some educational institutions who are capturing data, but they capture only the basic data. And they lack ability to discover the meaningful patterns. Given the technology advancement, each kind of data can be captured and stored, which they are not doing. At the same time, there are three drivers for demand for analytics in the education sector in India. First, India is a knowledge-based economy and technology is beginning to have a huge impact. Two, there is competitiveness among educational institutions to attract the best talent and offer the best academic experience. Three, it is India's digitization initiatives. Skill India is an important part to tackle the skill gap and we need to have base data to do this. Education sector in India is warming up so far as analytics is concerned, but there are various challenges. There is low awareness about the opportunities that analytics has to offer. There is absence of culture of data-driven decisions. So there is a need to have a promoter or a leader who can spearhead the analytics initiative in educational institutions. There are some experts which are of the view that there is no clarity on privacy law. Funding is also limited. So there are various challenges that are faced by the education sector so far as data analytics is concerned. But there is tremendous growth opportunity as the compound annual growth rate of this sector is 24.4%. And this market is going to be more than double in the coming few years. So uh, while specific numbers of uh, analytics in education are not available, but there is definitely a huge opportunity that lies ahead. So I conclude this whole presentation by a few pointers. One, one of the main objectives is of learning analytics is to minimize the failure of students and improve the learning standards. So learning analytics is an important asset for educational institutions. It gives prior information about the students who are at risk. So the teachers can concentrate on specific or a group of students to improve their knowledge in the subject. It's, so it influences the future by changing the present. And it's all about action. That is, it's all about leadership and culture. In order to implement it successfully, one must begin with the seed project. And while doing so, one should not focus only on technology, but involve all the stakeholders. And last sentence I would like to say is that learning analytics help the learner to become a better learner and teacher to become a better teacher. Thank you. 
Any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Poonam. Our time is up. Um, I gave you five more minutes, but that oh, was amazing. So but what I'd thank like you. to suggest, thank Poonam, yes. is that for questions that uh, people go to, let me share the link, to the open discussion in the uh, conference area. Okay, yes, so this, yes, is, this is the section to go to so that we can yes. continue the conversation. I hope you'll also go there. And uh, right. if you have any questions or comments, please feel, because there, there was a lot of information, um, if you could also share the PowerPoint presentation or the PDF with me, Gunam, I will add it in the uh, conference area for everyone to view so they can refer to it. So thank you so much thank you. Thank for this you so amazing much. presentation. And we want to continue. So we'll see you on the Moodle for a continuation. It was amazing. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank we'll you. see you at the next thank session you. in about nine minutes. Thank you, Poonam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nelly. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to be here at this platform. Each time I enjoy. Thank you. We enjoyed you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.